All right, today we will listen to chapter 11. Before we do that, I just want to refresh your memory. We left off yesterday with Brian has forgotten about the searchers and he was kind of upset with himself for forgetting that he should be looking for the searchers to come and find him. <coughs> All right, chapter 11. There were these things to do. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all his will to keep from eating another one as he moved them. But he got it done, and when they were out of sight again, it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh, that. Cleaning up the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hang it in the sun to dry and bury the juice that had soaked in it and smooth the sand where he slept. This kind of has me thinking about what y'all are doing right now. Are you cleaning up your bedrooms when you get up in the morning since you don't have to get to school so early? Hmm. Are you eating all the food you can get your hands on because you're at home and not at school? Just some thoughts that I thought of while I was reading that page. But it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet. And when he was busy and had something to do, the depression seemed to leave. There were the things to do. With the camp squared away, he brought in more wood. He had decided to always have enough on hand for three days, and after spending one night with the fire for a friend, he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take. He worked all through the morning at the wood, breaking down dead limbs, and breaking or chopping them into smaller pieces, storing them neatly beneath the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and in his reflection he saw that the swelling on his head was nearly gone. There was no pain there, so he assumed that that had taken care of itself. His leg was also back to normal. Although he had a small pattern of holes, roughly star-shaped, where the quills had nailed him. And while he was standing at the lake shore, taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he had been slightly heavy, with a little extra weight just above his belt at the sides. This was completely gone, and his stomach had caved in to the hunger and the sun had cooked him past burning. So he was tanning and with the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. Did you hear that simile? He compared his face to leather all because of the smoke. But perhaps more than his body was the change in his mind or in the way he was, was becoming. That makes me think back to the last chapter when he called himself a city boy and he was thinking thoughts that someone from the city would be thinking. Now he's becoming kind of like a country boy. He's out in the country with no one around. I am not the same, he thought. I see, I hear differently. He did not know when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but would know the sound. He would swing and look at it, a breaking twig, a movement of air, and know the sound as if he somehow could move his mind back down the wave of sound to the source. 
He could know what the sound was before he realized he had heard it. And when he saw something, a bird moving a wing inside a brush or a ripple on the water, he would truly see that thing, not just notice it as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all the parts of it, see the whole thing, the feathers, see the color of the feathers, see the bush and the size and the shape and the color of its leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water and see what the wind made and see that the wind made the ripples and which way the wind had to blow to make the ripples move in a certain way. None of that used to be in Brian and now it was part of him, a changed part of him, a grown part of him. And the two things, his mind and his body, had come together as well, had made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. Then his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight. His mind took control of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it, to deal with it. There were these things to do. When the wood was done, he decided to get a signal fire ready. Remember he talked about that earlier, a way that he would be able to signal an airplane that may be flying by. He moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff over his shelter and was pleased to find a large flat stone area. More wood, he thought, moaning inwardly. He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs, carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, he had thought of, of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He would never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready. And if he heard an engine, or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff, with wood, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake, and rested. The lake lay before him, 20 or so feet below, and he had not seen it this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, he had a moment of fear, a breath-tightening little rip of terror. But it passed, and he was quickly caught up in the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal. From his height, he could not see just the lake, but he could see across part of the forest, a green carpet, and it was full of life, birds, insects. There was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L-shaped lake, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown. Bent and gnarled, he's describing the tree, how the tree has grown even though it has bent over. Sitting on one limb was a bluebird with a crest and a sharp beak, a kingfisher. He thought of a picture he had seen once which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split second later. In its mouth was a small fish, wiggling, silver in the sun. It took the fish to the limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. <laughs>